So last time we talked, we went over so much of your first book, The GI Diary. Right. Um, I'd love to talk about um, your book that you wrote in 74 about pride and love, the poems and... Oh, yeah. Wh where did that kind of come from? How did you get into uh, that? That was... Uh Developed from uh, Knopf Books at uh, Random House, I mm. believe. They came to me and approached me to do the work on, on that book. Uh, Nan Talese was the editor. Yeah. So, she, uh, Kay Talese's wife. Yeah. Because this is... So this is just after Superfly, a couple of years, um, obviously Shaft, I but it's really the height. It's it's before we lose your brother in '79. So this is kind of the height of the Parks family, really. Well, it was. Uh, I worked on it uh, during. Actually, I was. We were shooting uh, Shaft's big score. Yeah. And, uh, and I did the photographs, a lot of the photographs, as we were shooting the film. Shaft score. Uh, I was taking photographs for the book. <laughs> it uh, kind of worked out because <clears throat> the uh, photographs worked out in conjunction with the film. So, yeah. um, as far as because you right after that was Aaron and Angela, if I'm not mistaken. You know, it might have been during. <laughs> I mean, we were doing a lot of films. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you, uh, between 19, 1970, 69, wherever, and 75, 76, uh, we were shooting a lot of film. I was working on a lot of film. And uh, so, yeah, Aaron Los Angeles was in there, too. That's a pretty great film for you and your brother because that's Jose Feliciano. Was he did the music, yes. And then I think that's Irene. Kevin Hooks. Yeah. And his dad. Uh, uh, yeah, his father was in there. And Moses? Irene. Moses was in the film? Moses was in the film. Irene Karras. I think that's Irene's debut on I film. I think it was, yeah. That's so crazy. She, she, was, she was more theatrical. Yeah. And uh, she did a very good job. I... Uh, remember the beginning of that film um, I was up at the old man's house, uh, uh, apartment and my brother comes in and he says I gotta go catch a plane to LA to talk to the producers at Columbia and uh, the old man says what for and he says I got this script that they want me to do so he says, is it any good? He says, I don't know. I haven't read it. <laughs> but I'm going to go anyway. Uh, uh, so he said, David, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just hanging out with the old man, having a little wine and dine. And so he says, go to the airport with me. I want you to read the script. I said, OK. So I went to the, I got in the, in the uh, car and uh, we took off on the airport. He handed me the script and I don't think I got further into it than maybe five or 10 pages. And I handed it back to him and I said, this ain't gonna work. <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? I said, man, this is a bad idea. He says, well, don't say anything, just, I got my money involved in this. I said, you, you got your, you're one of the investors. He says, yeah, I got, I, got, I, got, I got a piece of the action. So I didn't say nothing, you know, I just, it, it was bad. It, the script was good, but the idea, it was not timely. You have a Puerto Rican girl with a black dude, that don't work. That's the first thing that hit me. I said, man, this ain't going to work. <laughs> and it eventually did not work the way it should have. Mm. But that's that's the sign of the times, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, 
They were trying to break barriers, but that, that's one. Uh, that's a hard barrier. <laughs> yeah, in the mid seventies. Yeah, that's a hard barrier. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he went to L.A., cut the deal, came back, got the crew, Superfly crew together, and uh, we started working for Columbia. So, and that's I guess. That was after I had worked on, see, I was working on a lot of films. We did Lead Belly in Austin. Yeah. So I had just gotten back from Austin mm. before we started on that. So I, as I said, I mean, we were shooting film then. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you sort of get hung up into a, a, a flow where you, all you do is what you're supposed to do. and. Don't even think about it. <laughs> As for, um, gosh, your your brother was filming. Was it when he went to Africa? When when we lost him, was that for the film Revenge that was never completed? I think so. Um, we had very little information on it, and uh, it was a deal out of L.A. Uh, and so they were, uh, and I saw Gordon again in New York, Junior, and I said, well, he, he, he didn't really talk much about it, he just said, well, we're going to go and shoot it. And I said, well, you're taking the crew, you know, Kurt Baker, who's, the, who's his right-hand man, and... I'm Kurt Baker's left hand man. <laughs> and I he says, no, I'm just taking Jimmy with him. Jimmy was a production assistant. And uh, he took Jimmy with him. But he left the rest of the crew. I said, man, I don't know if that's a good idea to go to Africa without your crew because, you know, you're not covered. You know, we, we had, we covered him covered Gordon senior you know I mean once you get a crew together you know it's it's hard to break that bond of trust yeah and uh, when you're shooting film you need to have the trust of your crew and if you have to pick up a crew like that in Africa I mean it's ain't like going to Cleveland Ohio I mean or someplace Chicago this is Africa and it turned out to be uh, a bad deal. Uh, we don't know the specifics of it. Uh, well, all we know is the plane crashed. Uh, Jimmy uh, was supposed to be on the uh, plane with him, but he was late, he had been out partying, so he missed the plane. <laughs> I said, that's the best miss you ever had. He <laughs> said, you got that right. And, um, Apparently, um, the producer, it was the producer's plane, it was this private plane, they were overloaded, they were trying to get to an area where they were having a, a conflict, where they were going to film from the air, and on, if they could, get on the ground and shoot a war going on between tribes. A real war. A real war. <laughs> they had to do crazy things. <laughs> and uh, they were going to try to get on the ground to do that. But the plane on takeoff crashed. Mm. So that's where he got uh, lost his life. And it turned out to be later when they did the uh, uh, investigation, they found out that someone had sabotaged the plane uh, and put, I believe, like sugar into the gas tank and never got the combustion up in order to get off the ground. So, wow. that's what happened there. How hard did this hit you and your dad? I mean, oh. this must have been tragic. He oh. was 44. I guess so, yeah, I was 34. Yeah. <laughs> He's 10 years older than me, so. Uh, well, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, it was it was devastating. 
you know, it's not like somebody dying from cancer or something where you know the possibilities of someone passing, you know, you, you get prepared for that. Yeah. But when something like that happens, yeah, it, it was pretty devastating, especially to the old man. And, uh, you know, you get to the point where, well, I wish I would have said this and said that, but it's too late then, you know. Yeah. yeah it's basically uh, how it happened, yeah. You mentioned earlier Lead Belly, and I know you're, you're in Austin now. Um, yeah. While you were down in Austin then, um, what was that experience like? Because this would have been mid-70s as well. I think it was 75, 76, 75, because we did Aaron in 76. Uh, I was, it was one of the best films I ever worked on. Mm -hmm. I mean, Austin was great. We, um, they sent me as an advance man to set up pre-pre-production, uh, find locations, and deal with the local people for logistics and all that. Uh, I never forget, uh, the film was originally supposed to be shot in Louisiana. Wow. And it was, I think it was Baton Rouge, where we were originally supposed to shoot it. And, but Texas sent this uh, gorgeous woman <laughs> up <laughs> to meet Dad. And I mean, she was six foot blonde, beautiful, you know. And she comes into the apartment and I'm sitting there and I say, oh my God, what, what the goddess of liberty. <laughs> and she sits down, we have some wine and some lunch, small lunch and then whatever. So, well, Mr. Parks, we understand you're going to uh, shoot the film in Louisiana. She said, yes, that's, the only, that's, that's what they were working on. Well, you just might want to think about shooting it in Texas. We have everything you need, and we can give you a good deal, incentives and all that. Yes, okay. So after spending the afternoon with her and getting to know her, Jeez, the old man finally came around. He says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to send my son down, David. I'm going to send him down to Texas to meet with you all. You give him the tour. And if he comes back alive, we'll come. We'll, we'll consider <laughs> <laughs> He makes it back from Texas. <laughs> if you make it back alive, <laughs> I mean, you know, didn't have the greatest reputation. <laughs> At that time, it wasn't that. Uh, prolific in film. So I ended up going down there and I was spend I, I must have spent in pre pre production about oh three quarters of a year. Wow. Yeah, and then, oh yeah, they, they sent me around and I got to meet all the people that were going to coordinate the production. Everything from food to locations. We see what facilities they had and all that so we ended up shooting it in Austin I didn't realize you were down there that long though That's uh, well you know they uh, you're going into an area that needed to be explored I mean you know Texas wasn't famous for didn't have anything big before. production I mean, they're dropping 30 million dollars down there mm. and at that time what was it, 75, somewhere in there. $30 million is a lot of money. So they wanted to make sure that they had everything necessary from hotels to, because half the crew was black, yeah. which, you know, was a concern. And uh, they wanted to make sure everything was cool. Safe. And I did my homework and I got treated, I had a, good, had a great time, man. <laughs> had a ball. I, said, I go back to New York on the first trip, and I said, yeah, we want to go down there. <laughs> and the barbecue is good, too. <laughs> the barbecue is fantastic. But it was really, of all the films I've worked on, I've worked on films since 1962. Uh, was the first film I worked on was called Walk on the Wild Side. 
uh, a director, a prolific director from Ha LA, uh, uh, was directing it. Jane Fonda was in it. Capuchin, uh, Harvey Lawrence, Lawrence Harvey. I think it was Lawrence. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ed Demetric was the director. Okay. And so I ended up getting going there because uh, I was in school my last year in in uh, secondary school, high school. I was going to a private school. And I got you were like 17, 18. Yeah, maybe 60. I don't know. I don't, I don't keep track of <laughs> those things. And I ended up uh, getting booted out of the school for two weeks. Yeah, I screwed up. Uh, I got caught in my room on Sunday morning with a bottle of wine and I'm I was listening to Miles Davis, and I was supposed to be in church. It was a Methodist church, so <laughs> they ended up letting me go for two weeks suspension. And I show up in New York, and the old man says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I had a little problem in school, and I got to kill two weeks. He says, well, what am I going to do with you now? <laughs> I said, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm shooting a an assignment on this film being made in L.A. with Jane Fonda and for Life magazine. He was doing special photography, which I had done a lot too. And my brother did it, you know. It's when you shoot on a film and do publicity and get it into magazines and newspapers and whatever. So he says, well, I guess I gotta take you. I said, hey, <laughs> I'm ready to go. So, yeah, we get on the plane. Because um, at that time, he was divorced, and there was nobody at the house to keep me from <laughs> being overrun <laughs> with parties. <laughs> and so I, they found a seat for me in, in coach, and he comes back, and he hands me a script. And uh, uh, and I think the script was sh Shaft, I'm not sure. Wow. So I read the script on the way to, uh, to L.A. And, uh, I think it was. Man, there's so many movies. I, I really can't keep track. And you're asking me questions that nobody ever asked me anyway. <laughs> Just basically. Uh, so, uh, and long story short, I end up, uh, they, I end up on the set with him and I'm um, standing around, I'm carrying his cameras and stuff, you know, and the director says, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm son of Gordon Parks who's shooting. Oh, Gordon, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So he says, well, you just can't stand around on a movie set. You gotta be doing something. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? So I ended up, long story short, I ended up uh, being a gopher. <laughs> and I learned a lot, you know, I got a lot of, I got the instinct and I saw the man work. And the one thing he taught me was it wasn't that difficult. And you didn't, and, you, and when you shoot a film with a crew, you, you trust your crew. And, because I said to him, I said, you know, you're not telling any, you know, you're not telling people what to do. He says, why tell them what to do if you hire them to, to know what to do? I said, oh, ding dong, you know. So he was a good mentor for me to, follow yeah and my father did the same thing in very little direction because you do your rehearsals with the actors everybody else is pretty much tuned into what they do so you really don't have to tell anybody you see a lot of films where the director's going crazy and doing all that's that's a bunch of bullshit <laughs> you know I mean if you have a good crew you let them do their thing 
students, and I try to, I do a lot of lecturing to students, and I try to integrate that, those experiences. I'm curious, um, with the Gordon Parks Award that's given at Tallgrass now, right. um, when you get to watch these films, your knowledge is so vast. I'm curious, what are you looking for? What are you trying to see? What did you see in After Sherman that made that the winner this year? Well, the, the relevancy of the, pro of the project. Mm. I think uh, the idea and uh, the presentation of the idea is the important thing, mm. you know. And uh, there's, you know, there's guys doing films about his ex-wife having a horror show and <laughs> having a heart attack because he saw her in a dream. Mm. You know, <laughs> that doesn't grab me at all. So I, re I really look at the content of, even before I look at the movie, mm. the relevancy of what they're doing. And that, that to me is important. And I'm not into fiction. Mm. I mean, I, mean, I do historical documentaries uh, a lot, and uh, history. I'm, I'm not into making it up. I'm into documenting the past as well as showing the, uh, the comparison and the relevancy of, of, of the present, mm. you know. So you have to have an idea of where you're coming from, because you might end up repeating what you, uh, what has happened, you know. So that to me is very important. One of the document, one of the documentaries you've done, right, is very timely in the sense that, uh, with the passing of the Queen, Prince Charles became King Charles. Oh, you know about that. <laughs> and. You did a doc about Prince Charles coming to Texas right. in 86 for the 150th anniversary of the state. Sesquicentennial. Please uh, tell me about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was pretty interesting. Uh, God, you saw that. Yeah. Oh, okay. To find it was interesting, but yeah. How did you find it? It's it's online it's snippets, it. yeah. It's not a full, complete doc, but yeah. But they show that? It's yeah. clips. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, it was, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was quite a day. I had to capture that whole thing in one day. And uh, I was hired by the uh, Texas Capitol Committee mm. to shoot it. And it was put together pretty quickly. They came after me, I had to put a crew together, and find out what the hell I was doing and what was going on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, that, that was a, a very interesting day. It was one day, yeah. you know, and, uh, and then dealing with the British security and, <laughs> and <laughs> You can't look at them, you can't touch them, you know. Can I listen? You, know? <laughs> you can listen, but don't don't talk to them. I mean, that whole godly thing about princes and kings and queens, it's, 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 it really is off the chart, <laughs> you know. They're serious though, you know. But now you see them walking in crowds and shaking it. That's a big difference about what was going on then. I mean, we couldn't get more than 25 feet cl close to them, you know, why? but then again, you're in Texas, so you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's pretty loose down there when it comes to all that. But I enjoy doing it. It's cool, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, you know, I'm, I talked to him, I even shook his hand, you know. <laughs> I don't care, man. You know, it, uh, it, that's the way I feel, that's what I do. So I've got to ask, we talked a little bit about barbecue. Last time we <laughs> talked about barbecue too, but I didn't find out, what is your favorite type of barbecue meat? Is it brisket? Is it sausage? Is it pork? <laughs> what is it? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a favorite place, it's called, uh, it's in uh, Lockhart, Texas. The home of barbecue. The home of barbecue. Crisis. Yes. And oh man, it's and I, you know, I, I, 
That's what I do barbecue. Now, I mean, there are barbecue restaurants in, in Austin, but, and there's another place called Cooper's, mm -hmm. which is on your way to Midland. I'd go to Midland a lot, or West Texas, you know. So I always, when I'm coming out there, the guys out in Midland, they pick up a whole ton of that stuff, bring it, you know. We'll be partying. But crisis is, well, the Germans were the first group of people to really start to settle Texas. Like Fredericksburg, that whole area. All that area. Yeah. Uh, Lockhart, uh, New Bronzeville. That was the first area that they settled. And then they moved west, north and south. And, but the German influence in Texas is pretty heavy. Yeah. Uh, but when you go to crisis, man, I mean, they have this huge area where they have all the wood that gives it the flavor and all that. And they started smoking it. And like the Mexicans, they, they grill it. They don't, they don't smoke it like the Germans do. And they got, you know, they, they, Mexican barbecue is good too. Matter of fact, barbecue barbacoa yeah. was uh, uh, started in a place called Laredo, Texas. Mm -hmm. But I, I love brisket, uh, uh, cabrito, mm -hmm. baby goat. Yeah. Whew, that's really good. <laughs> and. Uh, you get the uh, German sausage, all that stuff, they, and it's the wood. And I mean, they don't, when, what they do with the wood is they stack it outside and they give it a year to two years to procure, you know, and, and, and ferment before they put it on the, on the grill or put it in the stove. Gives it that... Oh, the taste. It's gorgeous, man. It's, you go down to Lockhart, for example, and you see people that big, man. I mean, they're addicted to it. Uh, they, they go crazy over it. I make the trip about once a month, you know. <laughs> well, David, you got me hungry, so I don't have any more questions for you today. <laughs> okay. Well, um... I appreciate the interview. Uh, hope I g was able to give you some insight. You know, so what's interesting is, is that you didn't ask me, well, what's it like to be the son of Gordon Barks? Well, we chatted so much last time. I well, didn't, I didn't know if you could. I understood what, you had a sound problem with that footage. Well, we got the first part, so, I mean, I would love to, I mean, the only part that we didn't get on camera was when we talked, we talked about your dad being such a good athlete and oh, yeah. the tennis playing and how he that skied, he was a skier i mean skier. It elongated his life because he's so he was so in good shape well that's that's the important thing i talk to students about is that you know if you just home in on film 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 you get burned out mm -hmm. you, you know you have to have another area of passion to uh counteract the intensity that film requires, mm -hmm. or writing, or painting, you know, and uh, I, so he he embedded in the family, my brother and I, and uh, a, uh, an interest in sports. So we, I've, I've done a lot of sports. I was, uh, I don't want to brag or anything, but I, I was, I learned soccer in France, so I was a pretty good soccer player. Mm. So the school I went to, the boarding school, one of the four <laughs> that I, I was able to get through, I ended up being a soccer star because I could dribble the ball and uh, I knew, I knew that, and then I went into, uh, I tried my hand at basketball until I got to college. <laughs> and then when you see these six foot, <laughs> six foot eight, six foot nine people coming down on you, I, this is not for me. But I did do a lot of, I was on a downhill skiing team 
at Ricker College, which was the first college I went to before I went to Nam. And I did the downhill and the giant slalom, and I was ranked around on the downhill, I was ranked about 80th in this country. Mm. On the giant slalom, I was ranked about 40th. Wow. So I, I was pretty good skier, wow. um, racer. And then when I got back from Vietnam and uh, started to get back into tennis, I was ranked in tennis too. I, I don't remember the last ranking I had, but I played with, I played guys like, believe it or not, Rod Labor and yeah. Ken Rosewall and John Newcomb. I was in that era, just before Arthur Ashe, but I did play a, a number of t sets with Arthur. Uh, Jimmy Connors and I used to be tennis buddies. Uh, we used to go around hustling. <laughs> because uh, I spent a lot of time in L.A. when I was a kid, so I was on the junior tennis circuit, uh, USLTA. And Jimmy and I used to do uh, round robins, which is you get with a group of people and you play for money. And of course, they weren't supposed to know that. <laughs> and so when I played with Jimmy, Jimmy would say, Okay, I want you to get into the alley, you know, where the two lines for the doubles is. And stay there and let me take care of the rest. <laughs> Boy, we made a lot of money. <laughs> we we be playing a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of tennis. So, yeah, I went. I played with those guys, and uh, I've had a number of times. Pancho Gonzalez, which was, was probably one of the best tennis players along with Rod Laver, <clears throat> Rod Laver and at that time, Pancho, nobody could beat Pancho. Mm. And uh, he was from Mexico. He was fabulous. You know. And I played with his, uh, his son, Spencer Gonzalez, and Dino Martin Jr. Dino and I used to play tournaments around Robbins. Dino, little Dino was good, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so th th that was mostly in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, uh, Brown Robin Circle. We go to various t tennis courts and be playing for some serious money. <laughs> Just stay in the alley. <laughs> He'd be okay. No, we did okay. And I, you know, uh, now I'm into golf. Yeah. And now, uh, man, that's the most difficult game you ever played in your life. So now you're in Austin. What courses are you at? Oh, man, I play all the courses. I mean, uh, I have some favorites. Okay. Yeah, but I, I play, Austin, the whole place is a golf course. <laughs> <laughs> There's golf courses downtown, around the town, uh, out at the lake, Travis. I play all the courses, depending on who I'm playing with. What's your favorite course? <laughs> well, I actually live right across the street from a place called uh, uh, Lions, okay. which is the oldest golf course in, in in Austin. I live right across the street from it, and I, I have called Lions. It was the first course west of the Mississippi to allow blacks to play in, on. So it's kind of historical. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I got to the point where I, I could start to, I used to give private lessons, you know, and I, I got pretty good at golf, but I could teach better than I can play. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's the gab. <laughs> but I, I started teaching, uh, you know, private lessons and stuff. And I actually taught tennis uh, at a place uh, in Austin, Caswell Tennis Club, and uh, when I got down there, after a while, I just got tired. I got burned out mm. on photography, on filmmaking, and I took four years off and uh, lived next to a tennis facility and started teaching. And took four years off, ended up being about 15 years. <laughs> I just took a vacation, man. I was, I was tired, you know, of working. Not that I didn't want to work, and there wasn't that much work going on in Austin. 
So I had a chance. What I did was I was teaching tennis, playing tennis. And, uh, I wrote, I've written about six scripts. Mm. I got into writing scripts, uh, ideas, taking ideas and developing them into scripts. So I've got a stockpile of scripts, you know. So there's a whole bunch of future David Parks material out there. Well, when I pass, I'll probably find <laughs> you know. yeah, I got I got some good ideas. Uh, one of them is uh, smuggling, drug smuggling across the border, Mexico. Been to Mexico, did my research. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was fun. <laughs> and I've got some stuff on uh, West Texas. I've got some stuff. Uh, i got a script. Uh, oh, man. I, on Oklahoma. I wrote a script on uh, Cotton Gray. Wow. Okay. You ever hear it? Yeah. Yeah, I did a script. I did his niece. Uh, hired me to write a script on wow. his life. God, great. Whew. He's cool, man. So I did the research on that. I worked on that. And uh, his, his niece ended up getting on drugs, and so the money never came through on it. Mm -hmm. I still got the script. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, between Blood Belly and Cotton, I mean, there's yeah, a lot man, of I, I, was, I was doing a lot of writing. Yeah. Because there wasn't much filming going on. And I was shooting uh, documentaries on West Texas cattle business and cattle barons. So I, I went and lived in Midland for three years. And I went, I did the Good Night Loving Trail mm. history, which was fascinating. Started out in, at the border at Presidio and worked my way to Paladero Canyon and went into uh, uh, Colorado and on up into followed the trail. Wow. And the, the ranches are still there. The, the, the old cattle baron ranches are still in the family. And they have the research. I mean, they don't, they don't give it to this capital in Texas, you know, to be buried. They keep that research in their, in their ranches. So I got the real hardcore information on it. I, I really spent about three, four years shooting that project. And I went, uh, I've been on some of the oldest cattle ranches in, in West Texas and uh, unbelievable. I, I, the, the people are cool, man. I mean, the, the West Texas people are real cool. Either yup or no. Yeah. And they don't mess around, you know. You gotta hold your liquor. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, you know, and, and, and there are not that, that many people out there. There are not that many people out there, so when anybody comes out there, they really are friendly. Mm. Really. Not like Austin. Austin's kind of eh. Houston is Houston, and Dallas is Dallas. But I would say the most important city in, in uh, uh, Texas would be San Antonio. Whew. That's where the cream, of the, the cream of history exists, with the families, the traditions, the Alamo. Yeah. Alamo City. Spent about three years down there researching Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. Researching uh, that was with your dad too, right? No, that's it was pre. Okay. Yeah, I've got a script on the Buffalo Soldiers, wow. which I'm working on getting. I have a producer trying to pull it together, and uh, as I said, I've got about six or seven scripts that I'm, I've been working on. But I would say the Good Night Loving Trail is basically you saw Lonesome Dove. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, Lonesome Dove was uh, McMurtry's cream de la creme. Yeah. And 
well done. I mean, that's what it was all about. If there's a film about the cattle business, that's the film you want to look at. Then don't forget Rawhide. <laughs> don't forget Rawhide. Clint Eastwood and the boys. They did a fabulous job. Yeah. And I watch Gunsmoke all the time. My favorite Gunsmoke still, Miss Kitty and Matt and the boys. Because they were good stories and they were good characters and the stories were true. They weren't made up. Yeah. I mean, that's Western Kansas. And I never realized it when I was a kid, when I was watching it, how relevant they were. Now I do. Yeah. I look at the stories and the, the characters and the culture, and man, they're right on. I mean, you can see other stuff on Westerns and, you know, Roy Rogers and all that. It, it, it's kind of made up. They make, you know, some of it's basically true, but it's, it's commercial and they, you know, so that's, you know. Are you a cowboy boot wearer? Oh yeah, uh, I, I do when I have to, when I ride horses. We did a lot of horse riding. My brother had a horse ranch out in Topanga Canyon when he was living out there. And we had horses in White Plains when I was a kid. So I grew up, you know, yeah, I ride. But I, I'm really basically a Manhattan cowboy. And I don't know if you ever lived there or been there. I've been in Manhattan. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not a cowboy, though. But have you lived there for a while? No. Well, it, it, it gets to, it can get to you. So you have to find an escape. And one of the biggest escapes when I was living there were cowboy movies. Mm. You want to get some open space, some air, you know, the whole thing. Uh, 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 you want to escape out of that jungle. And uh, some peace of mind and, you know. But you know, you can walk around New York in the old days and find a cowboy movie now and then. And just on a gray day and it's raining and ah, I just go in there. Cause there are movie theaters all over the place. Little ones, big ones, you know. And uh, you could you could hide for about three four hours, you know, <laughs> escape the jungle. Have you spent much time there? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I like New York. Uh, I haven't lived there though. I mean, yeah. Well, if you live there, you have to. Yeah. If you if you don't, it's not a place where you go. Uh, I like this place. I think I no. You you want to make some money? You want to get some education you want to learn about the uh, meaning of life that's the place I've been to a lot of countries you know one of the most fascinating things is I've been to a lot of I've been around the world except for communist countries about three to four times and I've flown into France didn't y'all live in Switzerland? No, France. Yeah, but you went to Switzerland. Yeah, I, I had a girlfriend there. I lived there. Yeah, yeah. There. I did. You know. And I liked that. Uh, and then Italy, Rome. But there is one place when you, you fly in, you look, you get a chance to see the overall picture. And the one thing about New York is you fly back, you fly into New York, and you say, wow, how did they do that? It's awesome, you know, to, to, you just have to scratch your head and say, how the hell did they do this? Every time I come in, I'm just fascinated with it. It's like amazing. How did they do it? <laughs> you know? And how are they continuing to do it, you know? Well, David, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you, you chatting with me. Thank you. Thank you. You asked some very good questions, and I appreciate it.